Thank you. So I'm going to talk to you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to mainly be a speech of um, is's rather than oughts. Uh, and I'm going to speak to you uh, mainly about what the implications would be for the rest of the European Union if the UK were to leave, which is perhaps at least 50-50. Uh, so many people imagine a scenario like this. So this seems to be built into some of the uh, some of the modeling done by bodies such as the OECD and the uh, Treasury and uh, probably, I imagine when we get it, the IMF's model. So we have the language, so Juncker's language, that, that Britain would be treated as a deserter uh, and punished as such. Uh, there's the talk that the whip hand will be held by the EU and any negotiations because uh, the e EU's exports to the uh, UK are worth about 3% of EU GDP. Uh, and uh, whereas they're 13% of uh, the UK GDP as the exports to the EU. So uh, there's the usual thought that the person who needs is the person who loses in trade negotiations, and the suggestion is that that would be the UK. Uh, it's put that the UK, if it wants to get any kind of intimate relationship, it would have to accept free movement of persons. Um, that's uh, been tried, to, people have suggested to be uh, quite clear. Um, maybe would actually, formally speaking, probably be unlikely to have as attractive a, an arrangement as Norway, because Norway has a power of reservation in respect of various sorts of regulations, so it has in principle a veto. It just is unable to exercise it because it's very small. It would be dangerous to grant the UK a power of veto because there might be areas where it would actually do it. Um, if uh, we weren't in the, if the UK didn't get into the European economic area, there'd be some deal on goods, none on services at all. Hungry eyes would look to the city, which would then be uh, vast parts of which would be relocated to uh, Paris and Frankfurt and uh, so on. Um, the, uh, some, the OECD assumed that the, we would have some negotiations which would be complete in 2018. We wouldn't get any deal until 2023, so the UK would then spend a period of being outside the EU from 2018 to 2023, and as part of the disruption associated with this, EU GDP would fall by 1%. So, coming, so bearing in mind that my focus here is on the EU side of this equation, right? So the suggestion is that, uh, that, the, that there'd be this sort of negotiation which would result in EU GDP uh, having taken a 1% uh, short-run hit, the remarkable one-third of the uh, value of uh, exports to the UK. Um, and, as I say, a long time to make a deal, eventually seven years. I think that this whole scenario is just very, very implausible. So why do, why do people take a long time to have trade deals? Some trade deals end up being seven years and plus. One aspect of that is, in particular, the role of the United States and the difficulty of getting anything through Congress. Uh, uh, the reasons why trade deals can take a long time is because there are very considerable political pressures to keep things the same. So if you have some factories and things of that sort, you have some, when you have a trade deal, the normal situation is that you have tangible losers and obscure, um, diverse gainers. So what that means is the tangible losers will come along and they say, it's all very well, all these theoretical things you get from more competition and so on, but I've got a factory in your marginal constituency and my factory workers are, are, are going to lose their jobs. How's that going to go for you, Mr. Politician? And those sorts of pressures mean that until you can really sell a, sell a story where you've dotted all the I's and crossed the T's about how there's broad enough gains to get political constituency behind you, things got bogged down. They can take quite a while to agree. But in the case of the UK leaving the EU, the political pressure to keep things the same would be a political pressure to do a deal, not to oppose a deal. There'd be enormous pressure from those uh, firms that export to the UK, from those consumers who buy things from the UK at the moment across the EU. There'd be enormous pressure to try to keep things the same for as long as possible. So until you'd worked out, I think that much the most natural assumption is that until you'd worked out all the I's and dotted the T's of a final deal, you would come to an interim deal that sought to keep things much the same. That would be the normal political uh, economy assumption, I think. A second thing to bear in mind, in, in some of, in, in the reason why this whole scenario is just very implausible, I think, is that um, the, it's not feasible to make the City of London relocate in the way that people suggest. If the City of London were going to relocate elsewhere in the EU, it would have done it in 2003. There were a lot of people who suggested it might do it in time. In fact, Christine Lagarde herself uh, made some attempts in 2008, 2009 to get the city to relocate, phoning around heads of government and that kind of thing to get them to go to a wonderful Paris. Um, if you think about the, it, though, why, is, why are those activities in the city rather than elsewhere in the EU as things stand, given that the, US, that the UK is not in the euro? 
Uh, people talk about time zone in English and that kind of stuff. I don't think that's really it when it comes to it. The reason why activities are in the city is because if you're going to take a whole heap of clever people and you give them a lot of money to do some smart kind of jobs, they're, going to, going to, be, they're going to want to believe, A, that they're going to be able to get the money, and B, that it's going to be fun to spend it. So getting the money means I think I'm not going to be subject to 80% taxes, to uh, bonus ta uh, caps, to clawbacks, to remuneration limits. Paris is not that place. Right? You can't go there because you don't believe you're going to get the money. Second, it's got to be fun to spend it. Frankfurt is not that place. Right? So you're not going to relocate elsewhere. You can, the, it, whereas, when we, if you went back 10 or 15 years ago, people talked about who were the competitors to London, places like Paris and Frankfurt were talked about. These days, though, it's the other great world cities, places like New York or Shanghai. So those are places you could imagine driving activity out to. If, you, if the city wanted to cut up rough, uh, sorry, if the EU wanted to cut up rough, maybe it could drive EU activity, uh, UK activities out to New York. But what that would do is to damage the EU's access to that, those activities since it can't move it inside the EU's regulatory net. What would happen then? Well, you, the UK provides 24% of value added in financial services for, across the European Union, and the EU's corporate and finance sectors are heavily dependent on their access to the city. And those sectors are, at the moment, very weak. So the, uh, the EU, both the EU cor corporate and finance sectors are very vulnerable. I can't see them having any appetite to get into a squabble that would mean that they were cut off from access to those key city services which keep them going. And I don't think, so I think the enormous pressure would be to maintain, to come to an accommodation with the UK whereby they continue to have good access to the city. Um, I think that the way it would be likely to work is, again, one of the factor on these things is uh, the EU's budget. So I think the actual Brexit would be likely to take place at the end of the current EU budget framework in 2020. I think we would then have a temporary EEA arrangement till probably about 2023, and we would be gone by the middle of the next parliament. You can't really wait any longer than that, because uh, the, the voters won't accept any... They'll, we'll have to leave in the next parliament to end free movement. Right? So we have to be outside the EEA by then. But we don't have to leave, I don't think, until then. Um, so I think we would leave in 2020 because there'd be no appetite on anybody's part across the EU to unpick the EU's budget framework, especially if you're taking out somebody who provides lots of money. Otherwise, the Germans and so on are going to have to find some extra money to fund lots of EU programmes up to 2020. They're not going to want to do that. Everybody will agree that the natural thing is to do it in 2020, which, apart from anything else, is very conveniently placed for the next UK general election. So a new prime minister comes in, we've left the EU, it's all a clean start. In the meantime, so... If you assume that that's the kind of way things might go, I think that uh, we're, you're not very likely to have this scenario where the EU economy takes a 1% hit following in the, in the way, dis, way described by the OECD following the uh, uh, Brexit. I think that the more uh, immediate uh, economic impact will be the following. The last thing the European Union would want, EU leaders would want in the event of a Brexit, is to that to spiral into a domino effect of other EU countries which have uh, tense relationships with the uh, central EU authorities, having their own referendum, and then going, so you could imagine you have a referendum in Poland or with the tensions there, maybe Hungary with tensions here, and that that then spilled over into referendum on leaving the euro in Finland and the Netherlands, and eventually you get to the ones in France and Germany and it's all that. So they would want to nip that in the bud, I think, by making it much more expensive to leave for anybody who's marginal by saying you've got to join the euro. Right? So I think that the pressure would be enormous on countries that have a treaty commitment to join the euro but not have, don't yet have a date. The immediate pressure would be go and find them all and say, name a date. If you're not going to be in, we're going to work out what you would do with you. I'll tell you what will happen to that in a moment. If you're going to be in, name the date. I want a date. I think that you could imagine... Uh, a lot of the current members, because I think almost everybody would agree to join the euro under that kind of pressure, uh, joining the ERM2 by the end of 2016, so, uh, so which, which is one of the qualifying conditions. So if you think of sort of financial market implications, I think that you could face that sort of pressure in that, over that sort of time scale. Um, what will happen to the countries that say, no, we're not doing it? I think that there's no long-run future for any non-Eurozone EU. I don't think that's true, even if the UK stays. But I think it's very clear that it's a done 
It's a dead duck if the UK leaves. This, you can't have a non-Euro EU. That's not going to work. There was never any intention of having a non-Euro EU in the first place. Uh, they didn't want to guarantee any opt-outs to anybody. And, and the whole idea is preposterous for reasons I'll come in a moment. Um, but, so I think that, the, uh, that that will be done. If you don't join the Euro, what will happen is that you'll be uh, rolled together with the uh, non-Euro, non-EU, EEA, countries like Norway. And so instead of the th current three-tier structure, the Euro members, the non-Euro EU, and the non-EU EEA, you'll have a two-tier structure. If you go to that, so that you then have that the Eurozone has, is, becomes the same thing as the European Union, as it was always intended to be, you will, by that device, address much of the Eurozone's current governance issues, and you will also allow the Eurozone to extend political integration without the need for new treaties, which might be very difficult to get through in a number of places. It's a key goal of the process of further political integration to avoid new treaties, so you don't end up with repeats of the situation that you had with the Lisbon Treaty and so on. So <coughs> the way I would expect that to work uh, is that the uh, EU... So wh why is that important? Well, just let me think of, say that just for a moment. The... I think that the key to the resolution of the Eurozone crisis is two things. One is it has to be accepted that the Germans are not going to pay the Italians' debts. I think that that really is the core of the Eurozone crisis. If you thought of one thing that it was all about, it was that the continuous threat and pressure on the Germans to say, you have to pay the Italians' debts even though they had a treaty obligation not to do it, even though those debts were accumulated before the euro even existed, and even though it's, I consider it to be as well as immoral, preposterous as an idea that it would work, that's the continuous pressure. Until the Germans believe that every other scheme that you come up with, euro bonds and whatever, isn't a, some kind of subterfuge to make them pay the Italians' debts, they're not going to agree to any of the other schemes. The way it has to really work is you have to get to a situation where the, uh, to make a currency union on this sca scale a function where you have uh, all kinds of different shocks, different regions with different interests and different growth rates over time. You have to have a credible system of fiscal transfers. The EU has a system of tr fiscal transfers called uh, structural and cohesion funds, but those currently constitute only about 0.3% of GDP. In the UK, we're not one of the great uh, funders of regional policy. We have about 3% of GDP, uh, or 3 to 8%, depending on how you define it. In countries like Germany, it's even larger. It needs to be getting on for that, 8, 10 percent, 10 times as much as it is now. If you had that, even a much, even a much more modest version of um, uh, uh, Eurozone-focused structural and cohesion funds, suppose you gave the Poles and the Italians an extra 20 billion. None of this pay back 2 trillion of Eurozone debt, none of that. Suppose you just said, I'm going to give you an extra 20 billion euros a year. That would raise their GDP by 1 percent. Is that a lot? Well, it's more than those economies have grown in the entire period that they've been in the euro. Just to give you an idea of how much that is, right, as a consequence. So that's a significant uh, achievement that you could make, raising their GDP. And I think that that would be much more plausible. You'd need mechanisms to do that, which the Europeans say that they want to do, the establishment of a Eurozone treasury, Eurozone debt raising powers. You'd have to have centralized Eurozone spending. It couldn't be any of this business of the uh, match funding and the government there having to uh, take the initiative to get the money. Eurozone-based spending of funds with larger uh, structural funds, which might even be part of the quid pro quo, might be the carrot, as it were, that went with the stick to get those extra EU, uh, non-Euro EU members to agree to join under that pressure. So they come along to them all and they would say, you've got to join if you're going to be in the EU. If you do join, there'll be some extra money. Okay? And I think that people may agree to that. What might be some of the implications? If the Eurozone could address its... Uh, structural issues by setting up a more credible system of uh, flows, continuous flows of money, the way that other currency unions work. Um, uh, what could be the, I think that that could raise uh, the GDP growth rate of the uh, Eurozone, and I think that would be to the UK's benefit as well. In fact, I see that as one of the key benefits to the UK of leaving the EU. Um, uh, uh, so in the period, in the nine years to 2007, annual GDP growth of the Eurozone was about 2.3% uh, uh, on average since 2010, so you can just take out the Great Recession, average 0.8%, so that's a 1.5% differential. The UK has had a similar drop in its growth rate over the period, 2.9% to 2007, but it's only dropped by 0.8% to 2.1% uh, to 2015. So that means that the UK, so if you thought of it as a kind of global shock that we've had a slowdown, the slowdown in the Eurozone has been much faster than elsewhere in the developed world, countries like the UK. So if you thought of that 0.7% differential, 
They've already enacted some measures to address that, banking union and other kinds of things. But I think that you could credibly believe that you would cover another half of that by having a, um, a proper system of uh, Eurozone governance via taking control of the EU institutions, which in turn wouldn't need any more treaties, I don't believe. That could add something like 0.3% annual GDP growth to the Eurozone during the 2010s. My view on that, actually, uh, the, there was a, um, uh, a survey of economists done, EU economists done by Consensus Economics, a couple, which came out a couple of weeks ago. They, their view was that it would raise the GD, annual GDP growth rate of uh, the rest of the EU if the UK were to leave by about 0.1%. So I'm a little bit above them, but the principle that the rest of the EU would grow faster once the UK was out is a principle which is believed by EU economists outside the UK. Um, I think that, the, that this kind of structure where you, the uh, Eurozone seized its destiny, took control of the uh, institutions of the European Union, used them. We already have principles such as an elected EU president via the Spitzenkan and Arten process. We have the five presidents plan for the establishment of the Eurozone treasury and a, a more significant role for um, uh, debt raising and of spending within the, at the centralized EU level. I think that that could be the world's big economic story in a positive sense in the 2020s, in the way that the Eurozone crisis has been one of the big, world's big economic stories of the 2010s in a negative sense. Uh, so I think that this is an exciting possibility that one should, one should think that, the, uh, that Brexit could trigger faster growth across the Eurozone, more countries joining the Euro, the seizing of control of the Eurozone institutions by the by uh, the EU institutions by the Eurozone and as a consequence faster growth and better harmony in the European Union for us all.